Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars for PC, Mac, and Xbox 360. This is a real-time strategy game developed by EA Los Angeles and published for PC in March of 2007, although it later saw release on Xbox 360 and Mac. And right off the bat you're thinking, wait, Xbox 360? This is a real-time strategy game. Why the hell did it release on Xbox 360? Very good question. I have no idea because, let's face it, I haven't seen a single RTS that actually worked well on console. Even going back to the 90s with the N64 and PlayStation and all that, they've just never worked right. And when this thing is getting released on PC, Mac, and Xbox, probably should raise some warning signs, especially in the current EA climate, which even in 2007 was starting to really rear its ugly head. So, that begs the question, first off, how is this as a Command & Conquer game? Is it more of a CNC game than Generals was, even though Generals was still a pretty good game? Is it in the same vein as Generals, because it's the same developer doing it? And more importantly, how is it compared to every other strategy game of its day? Well, as far as presentation goes, it's a step up over Command & Conquer Generals in pretty much every regard, which one would hope, considering it came out about five years later. but. Even today, it actually looks pretty good, and that's mostly due to the particle effects. It has really good particle effects, and everything else is pretty solid for its time. It's nothing amazing. I mean, you got some pretty solid texture work, some pretty decent modeling and animation, for an RTS anyway. But ultimately, it's really just the absolute destruction that gets caused in this thing that makes it actually visually impressive, which I'm going to show you a bit of right now. As you can see, the explosions are especially nice to look at, but that said, you do have to keep in mind that other games were coming out even before this that just looked better than it did, so that is something you do have to keep in mind. But then there's the one aspect of the presentation which is definitely different from pretty much every other RTS out there, and that is the triumphant return of FMV cutscenes, featuring some pretty big name actors actually. I mean, you've got Michael Ironside playing the head GDI general, you got Billy D. Williams playing the uh, head of the GDI in general, which is crazy. And once again, Joseph Kakan returns as Kane the leader of the Brotherhood of Nod. And unlike in my Tiberian Sun and uh, original Command and Conquer reviews, I can actually show you a clip of him this time. Because this time it actually recorded properly. Rejoice, children of Nod, the blood of your oppressors will flow and 50 years of tyranny will finally end. Transformation is coming. A new day will dawn. The future is ours. And once again, he does a very good job as Kane, and the other actors do a pretty decent job considering the script they're working with is actually pretty cheesy. But even then, it lends a lot of charm to the game to have these FMV cutscenes that just straight up set it apart from pretty much every other RTS out there, even if the acting does sometimes fall kind of flat and doesn't work as well as you might hope it would. I think that's probably more an issue of the direction than the actual actors, so that's worth keeping in mind. Apart from that, there's the sound design to talk about, and it's actually not all that great. You've got some decent sound effects, they work alright for the most part, and you've got some fairly decent voice acting for the various units and such, but ultimately, what drags it down is the lack of Frank Klopaki. He was actually too busy on another project to work on Tiberium Wars, and it really shows when you play this thing. The music is actually incredibly weak compared to the rest of the Command & Conquer series, even Generals, oddly enough. At least Generals felt kind of like the Tom Clancy-esque vibe from Rainbow Six that you got from Bill Brown being part of the soundtrack, but this one just feels generic and lifeless, and... If anything, it tries to throw some dark in there and just doesn't work all that well. A game like this is crying out for the classic Command & Conquer style soundtracks, the industrial, the electronic, and what you get is fairly weak orchestral mixed in with a bit of electronic and it just doesn't work. Not like the previous soundtracks did. The previous soundtracks just at least got you amped up, and this one just doesn't, really. 
it's just kind of in the background and you barely even notice it at all. It's actually pretty sad. But ultimately what really matter here are the story and the gameplay. And the story in this takes place about 17 years after the events of Tiberian Sun and Firestorm in which GDI is now a global superpower that has effectively supplanted nation states. They still exist, but they don't really matter anymore. And the spread of Tiberium has reached pretty ridiculous levels. You have blue zones, which are only a handful of spots on the globe at this point, and they are completely untouched by Tiberium. But then there are the yellow zones, which are somewhat contaminated and hotly contested over with Nod. And these are pretty much turning into wastelands, whereas red zones are straight up Tiberium infested wastelands that are completely uninhabitable. So the world has seen a lot of problems arise from Tiberium since the original game and of course Tiberian Sun even though it was already starting to become problematic in Tiberian Sun. So GDI is basically trying to find ways to halt the spread of Tiberium, but then Nod rises up and mounts an absolutely massive offensive on GDI hardpoints. And for a while, GDI is completely overwhelmed. This is where the campaigns are going to branch off. You have your GDI campaign, where Initially, you are fighting against this massive assault that Nod is putting forth and trying to take back various blue zones as well as just thwart their plans in general. And if you play as the Nod, then you're going to be going up against GDI. You're going to be starting the massive offensive. And generally speaking, you're going to be doing nefarious things to further the Brotherhood's plot. But there's also a third campaign in this game. But to get to it you have to actually beat both of the other campaigns and that is the Scrin campaign. Now this one takes place after the events of both the GDI and Nod campaigns when both GDI and Nod are basically picking up the pieces after the massive conflict and the Scrin show up. More specifically they show up on the edge of the solar system. The Scrin are aliens and they immediately beeline for the red zones on Earth. Now, what they're doing there and all that, I'm not really going to tell you. Because, oddly enough, the story in this game is one of its stronger points, even though the story itself is actually rather cheesy and ridiculous at times. And this is basically in the same vein as Tiberian Sun, where the campaigns are actually some of the stronger points of the game. Specifically with regards to the actual plot that progresses, the FMV cutscenes are surprisingly interesting despite being as cheesy as they are. And you will find that it's oddly enough the gameplay that becomes the problem with this thing. Now, I had issues with the earlier Command and Conquerors in terms of their gameplay as well. Namely, they're very simplistic games and that's kind of hard to get past. Now, Generals upped the ante a bit and basically became a pretty standard RTS in the process. It really didn't feel like a Command and Conquer game at all. This time around, it definitely feels like an extension of the Command and Conquer series, but it also feels like Generals gameplay reskinned. And this is ultimately what's going to make or break it for you. You have the Command and Conquer stylings where you have the GDI, which relies on combined arms like it always has, and overwhelming firepower and high-tech stuff. You've got the Nod, which rely on hit-and-run tactics, using stealth, using underhanded sneaky things, that sort of thing. And then you have the Skrin, who are pretty unique in that they actually use Tiberium to enhance their various units, and they have interesting unit combinations. For example, you can get the Buzzers unit, which is the Skrin basic infantry, but it's extremely weak infantry that just swarms things and just tears them apart. But it's incredibly easy to take them down if you can even spot them. But they can also attach to vehicles to provide anti-personnel stuff instead of the vehicles just having to either run over enemies or um, just rely on other units to compensate for it. So that's actually a pretty interesting way of playing the game and the Skrin play pretty wildly differently from the other two factions even though 
they have similar capabilities to the GDI in terms of being very well rounded for the most part. And most of that does stem from their use of Tiberium as a weapon. I mean, for example, you've got tanks that can go and harvest Tiberium to power up their cannons, for example. But it's really hard to shake the feeling that this is just General's gameplay without the General's mechanic, and done with an aesthetic toward having squads as units, as opposed to just individual soldiers as the units. And while that does make it look like it has more scale and things like that, it really plays pretty much the same. Which is to say that it's a fairly standard RTS. The difference being that this time around, they did bring it back to Command and Conquer's roots in some regards. For example, with Tiberium. It's harvested the exact same way that it was in the old school games, where it's a refinery, and then you have a unit that goes from the refinery to the Tiberium field. It gets a bunch of Tiberium, it brings it back, and now you have a steady trickle of money. They brought back the interface from basically Red Alert 2, where you could select infantry, vehicles, um, aircraft, buildings, whatever you wanted to produce at any given point, and you could just select that, move to a different tab, select other things right on the fly, as opposed to having to click on individual buildings, and then click on the icon to produce units of those types. So that's back, and that's well appreciated, because that was something that I actually rather liked about the old school Command & Conquer games. They were very intuitive to play, so to speak. But other than that, it's pretty much just generals, where you have various support powers that you can activate, uh, many of which require money this time around, but some of them don't, and they will give you various things like uh, special airdrops for uh, paratroopers or things like that. And of course, super weapons make a return, namely things like the GDI's Ion Cannon. It's once again a support power like it would be in, say, Generals. So, it basically takes the sensibilities of the older school Command & Conquer games, namely Tiberian Sun and the original Command & Conquer, and it transplants them into Generals gameplay while also making units into squads as opposed to just plain units. And unfortunately, unlike Generals, it doesn't really feel welcome in Tiberium Wars. And part of that is because this thing came out in 2007. We had had RTSs come and go since then. And more importantly, we had had a lot more interesting RTSs come and go at that point. And some of them were still around, like, say, Company of Heroes, which still is pretty much going strong to this day. And a game like this, where it's basically just spam one or two unit types to win, and it's an extremely simplistic game overall, didn't really cut it anymore. It had been five years since Command & Conquer Generals, and while that game was great in its heyday, and it's aged considerably since then, but it's still fun to play in its own right, Something like Tiberium Wars just feels like a rehash to kind of just capitalize on the Command & Conquer name. I mean, at least it feels like a Command & Conquer game for the most part, apart from the whole music thing, and you can even enable a classic control scheme where the left click is what uh, sends your units all over the place instead of the right click, if you want, for some reason, so there are throwbacks. And it's certainly not a bad game, but by the time it came out, it felt dated, and that's the really big problem with it. And ultimately, that's what's going to make or break it for you. Does it hit all the right notes in terms of nostalgia for you if you're a fan of the Command & Conquer series? If so, you'll probably like it. And honestly, that's the level on which I enjoyed it. I didn't really enjoy this as an RTS. Compared to the other games of its time, it just feels kind of archaic, and if you're looking for a more complex strategy game like I tend to play, you're not going to get all that much out of Tiberium Wars. It does have some unit balancing problems that probably could have been worked out, like the Black Hand unit for Nod being kind of ridiculously overpowered, but there are ways you can counter that and they at least provide some counters to things like that. But ultimately, you're gonna find that there are just so many other games out there at the time this thing was released that are just more interesting. They're more engaging RTSs. This thing feels more like it's trying to cash in on nostalgia than anything else. 
It's not a bad game, but it's ultimately not all that impressive either. I give it a 3 out of 5. Thanks for watching.